the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the most helpful innovations in the field of television is the creation of the last week's summary of the show. Right? You know what I'm talking about? In one or two minutes, they basically catch you up on the key points from last week's episode. Helpful if you or someone you love has a tendency, perhaps, to fall asleep during the show. Do I remember this? Do you remember this happening? No, we've got to back up and watch last week's all over again. None of this is, none of this is re recognizable to me. And we get some of that today in the first lesson from the Acts of the Apostles. The author of Acts is basically doing exactly that. Last week on Batman. Now the Acts of the Apostles is of course the sequel to the Gospel of Luke with both books written by Luke the Physician. For those who came to the Ascension of Christ service this past Thursday evening, all 12 of you, you heard the story. Of, I'm not judging, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> Those people heard the story of the ascension of Christ into heaven from Luke's gospel. Jesus opened the minds of the disciples to understand the scriptures. He told them how his suffering, death, and resurrection was so that the message of God's forgiveness could spread through all the earth to all nations beginning right there in Jerusalem. He told them that they were witnesses to all of this and that soon they would receive power from on high to do this work. And the reading from this past Thursday concluded, Then Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple, blessing God. Feed. The sequel to the Gospel of Luke, Acts of the Apostles, then begins, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In the first book, Theopolis, in case you fell asleep, because it is the Bible and sometimes boring, but not really if you read it, but in the first book, Theophilus, just to remind you, I wrote about all the things Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day he was taken up to heaven. Oh, thank you, Luke, that's helpful. Luke then spends the first few verses repeating what happened after the resurrection of Jesus. And as we heard in the first lesson for today, telling us the, uh, the story of the ascension of Christ for the second time. <laughs> Except that, given this second opportunity to tell the story, Luke now adds some new and different details to his account. At the beginning of Acts, right before our reading actually began, Luke reiterated how Jesus told them to remain in Jerusalem to receive power through the Holy Spirit, the event we now know and celebrate as Pentecost next week, right? But he says more. In Acts, Luke also says, after his suffering, Jesus presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over the course of 40 days and speaking to them about the kingdom of God. So, in our reading for today, when we hear the apostles say to Jesus, Lord, is this the time that you will restore the kingdom to Israel? It makes me think they probably have not been paying attention these past 40 days. It's clear that they still don't understand what kind of a kingdom Jesus is bringing about, despite their three years of ministry with Jesus, despite 40 days of the resurrected Christ teaching them quite literally about the kingdom of God. They still think they're going to get the earthly kingdom. Jesus redirects them for what must be the hundredth time. You know, I wonder, being fully God, does this mean that Jesus did not face Paul <laughs> when his disciples would ask questions like this? Could he resist? I don't know. Jesus says it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father set by his own authority. Jesus then reiterates to them that what they need is the gift of the Holy Spirit, that this is what will make them witnesses to what he is doing, witnesses who will go out to the ends of the earth, not just Israel, our own people. 
Now, of course, it's tempting to join Jesus in a face palm when the apostles ask this question. I think we should resist. After all, who can blame? For centuries, Judaism had believed that this is precisely what the Messiah would do. The Messiah would come and restore the Davidic monarchy, casting off the bonds of oppression by geopolitical empires, finally making the Jewish people into a fully free and independent kingdom. A kingdom that perfectly worshipped God, that ordered its society around the commands of Torah for justice and peace for all people. That's the whole point of the Messiah. At least, they thought it was. And as Jesus said once at another point in the Gospels, it's important not to point out the speck of sawdust in your neighbor's eye when you have a whole plank of wood sticking out of your own. Because throughout history, the church has thought that what it needs is the kingdom given back to it. The power of empire and authority at its beck and call. And that temptation, that temptation to, relent, to wed your religious ideals to the power of the state still persists. We see it in our own time in the Christian nationalist movement here in the United States where some political and religious leaders insist that the United States was founded solely as a Christian nation. They say Judeo-Christian nation, but they don't seem to like Jewish people very much, so I don't think they really know what Judeo means. <laughs> they insist that the laws of the country should follow the teachings of the Bible. Well, no, that's not right either. It should follow their understanding of the teachings of the Bible, not recognizing that people like you and me or anyone else out there might read the Bible a little differently than them, but still. In the Christian nationalist movement, the goal of the church should be to re-Christianize this country according to what we think that means, to restore it to what we think its founding principles were, to, and to cast out and defeat anyone or anything that is contrary to their supposed holy aims. One of the profound difficulties with this movement other than its complete misreading of the history of the formation of our country, the actual principles of the Constitution upon which it was founded, let's just leave that aside. <laughs> One of the profound difficulties is that it also tends to blend rather sinisterly with white nationalism. And so Christian nationalists tend to be anti-immigrant. It tends to be patriarchal, arguing the rights of women should be rolled back. And it particularly tends to be rather violently opposed to LGBTQ Christian people as well. Not even willing to acknowledge that gay and lesbian Christians might exist. This is one of the reasons why Christian nationalism has been labeled as one of the most dangerous threats of domestic terrorism facing our country. It's one of the reasons why the FBI reports that over the past three years, since 2020, hate crimes against minorities have increased across the board 50%. The largest increase was in hate crimes against Asian people, up 167% in three years. Asian people who, who fit the white nationalist framework as a scapegoat for the pandemic. But the next highest group, were LGBTQ people who saw violent hate crimes against them increase 70% in the past three years alone. Words have consequences. And those consequences can be deadly. Now with many of you, I weep at this reality quite literally. But this reality is also why some people right here at St. John's are now frightened to serve at the Pride Worship Service we are hosting on Saturday, June 10th at Waterfront Stadium. A worship service on June 10th that will be right before the first ever Pride Festival in Grand Haven. Just this past week we had someone right into the office saying they didn't feel safe to come and serve. So they were just going to stay home. Now, just like during the days of the pandemic, when danger is real, we honor the decision of each individual to do what feels best and safe for them. Absolutely. 
We do that because we know that while some people will feel like it's safest to stay home, that that's the best decision for them on that day, we also know other people will sign up at the parish information table today and in the weeks to come to go down to Waterfront Stadium to stand with the gay and lesbian members of our community, the Tri-Cities, West Michigan, to stand with the gay and lesbian members of our own church who should be able to worship without fear. And to be honest, in the midst of all of this, I kind of feel how the apostles must have felt. If I was there on the Mount of Bethany with Jesus, if he was standing here today, I might say the same thing. Lord, when? When? Is this the time you'll restore the kingdom? Not to Israel or, of course, not to America. But is this the time, O oh Lord, when you'll restore God's kingdom? When you'll finally bring safety and peace and justice to all people in the earth so that the wolf can lie down with the lamb. A little child can lead us safe. And as much as I wish that God could flick a switch and heal this broken and hurting world, the brokenness right here in our area, I think that the words of Jesus to his apostles on the Mount of the Ascension are his words to you and me as well. Because in the midst of their anxiety and fearful hope, he tells them two very important things. First, he tells them to stay together and to give it some time, just a bit. And they do that. The apostles gather in Jerusalem and they wait. And secondly, as they wait, they pray. As theologian Will Williman reminds us, our waiting and praying indicate that the gift of the Spirit is never an assured possession of the church. It is a gift, and it is a gift which must constantly be sought anew in prayer. And so we, in times of anxiety, in times of longing for God's justice to be made real, in times of fear, we need to pause to spend some time in prayer, being present with God, sharing our concerns and our fear with God, but also listening to the voice of God as well, to what God will say, to what God will call us to do. If we don't first spend time in prayer, we run the risk of doing just what we wanted anyway. Of not, hearing, of not hearing what God may be calling us to in our own time. But thoughts and prayers, we know, are also never enough. Because after they spend time in prayer, Jesus tells them that the Holy Spirit will be poured out, that they will be clothed with power from on high, that this will enable them to be witnesses to a very different kind of kingdom than everyone else thought existed in their time. Enable them to be witness to, witnesses to a different kingdom than the religious thought they wanted or needed. A kingdom of love and gentleness kingdom of justice, care for all people, including those they didn't even think could be a part of the church at that point. And so we must know as well that we do not walk out into this broken world on our own. It is not through our own strength or our own wisdom that we will do what Christ will call us to do today and in the days ahead. No. It is because God has poured out the Holy Spirit into our lives, giving us words when we might otherwise stay silent, giving us wisdom to know when should we stay home and when should we stand up, giving us courage and strength, no matter our decisions, to still bear witness to Christ in our own time. We know, of course, as we heard at the end of today's reading from Acts, that Christ will return. 
that the world will be healed by God's love. And even those who are broken and enslaved by sin, discrimination, and hate, that they will be healed too. That all of us, all creation, will be made whole. We live with that hope. Christ will return, but our job as Christians is not to sit in church and gaze longingly into heaven, waiting. Until Christ returns, it falls to us. Centered in prayer, empowered by the Holy Spirit, it falls to us to be witnesses to Jesus' words and actions in the world, to what Jesus would do what Jesus would say, who Jesus would love. It falls to us to be witnesses to this in our country, in our county, 